Welcome back. How was lunch? Okay? Yeah? So now we have to get down. No, no, um, I hope we didn't eat too much and have a sleepiness after lunch. But that's not like you people anyway, so I shouldn't be worried about that. Our next speaker, who has a career that matches Akil's in its distinction, is also no stranger, stranger to the Schemmel Forum. Kevin Close has held important positions in journalism at home and abroad. Uh, he is an iconic media man, having served as head of the Washington Post's Russian desk, president of Radio Free Europe, president of National Public Radio, and dean of the College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, where he continues to serve as a professor. There is no one I know who is more qualified to take on the attack against the media in this administration. So let's hear, Kevin, now on the President versus the First Amendment. So thank you so much, Sandra and, uh, and Maury. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to uh, ask you if you wouldn't mind joining me in applause for both these amazing people. It's, a, it's an honor to be, to be back here with you, and I, I see that the, some, some people are missing, and I'm going to follow what I learned in the Soviet Union. I've taken their names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we, we've, it's very hard to, to follow two such accomplished uh, presenters as, as the two intellectuals. These guys are public intellectuals uh, of a dimension that we don't really see uh, so much. They're, they're telegenic, they are, uh, they are spontaneous, and they know their stuff. They really do. And uh, they, they, they set a challenge uh, for anybody who's in the lineup after them. But I could not imagine trying to do it before them and then having it go from me to them. That would not have been a proper handoff. <laughs> but but my, my excuse for what's going to happen next is that, after all, it is after lunch. <laughs> but I did want to say that the, the issue of the, of the president and, and, uh, and the First Amendment, it's actually before us. It's always been before us, but no, nobody in our lifetimes, one other, one other, occupant of the White House actually tested this nation about truthfulness <clears throat> and, and, and proper responsible speech responsible to the citizenry, and that was President Nixon. He failed the test. We know that. And in fact, in many ways, pr President Nixon uh, is a kind of, almost a template for the president we see now. But the difference is, is that most of what what Richard Nixon did was hidden from view through his almost his entire career, which went right back to, to the first congressional campaign that he that he waged in in, uh, in California, where, <clears throat> you know, typical in American in American political history, we know that the truth is an elusive presence in a lot of campaigns of all kinds. The truth is actually something which is disparaged, uh, misused, ignored or turned upside down and made it an untruth. That's typical in a lot of our, in our political history. You can go all the way back to, you know, to, to the, the times of the revolution. I mean, when this is a country whose, whose politics and whose issues can lead easily to highly emotional and often very, very incendiary uh, discussion, discourse, and, and press. But, President Nixon had a different take on all this, where most of that was hidden from view, as we know, from learning after the fact or late in his, in his career, the kinds of, the way his mind actually worked. And with his enemies list, with, his, with his, his paranoia about all kinds of people, starting principally with the Kennedy family, justified, unjustified, but was a big part of the way he conducted himself in his later years and in the presidency. And as we know, after the fact, from the day he came into office as president with this enormous potential power, began using his power in nefarious ways from the get-go. 
So there's a template there for a kind of misconduct at the highest levels in the most responsible position in the history of the world because we are a great democracy with a great nuclear and thermonuclear arsenal. We're the only people who've used it against others. We stand alone in that regard and it places the weight of history upon us in a different way. And to follow up on what Akilah was saying earlier today, you know, Citizens United, a lot of people upset about that. It brought tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars into the political campaigning of this country. It's up to the populace to pick, well, as Ben Bradley used to say at the Post when we got a very complicated story, can we pick the fly shit out of the pepper here? <laughs> we have to be able to do that. That's our responsibility. And we're now challenged in that, by that in a new way. I, I, I want to, I first of all, this is not a dark note. This is just realistic. We weren't born yesterday. We've been through a lot, all of us in this generation. Most of us were born into war at a time of war, of world war. I was born in 1940. How many here were born in that year? A few, few more of us. OK, one more, all right. And before that and after that, and our lives have been in this country have been engaged in for, foreign conflicts of one kind or another, either in response to others or missteps or appropriate on our part, right through, I can think of it right through my entire life. One event here, one event there, the invasion of Beirut in 58, I mean, things we don't even remember anymore that are all part of our commitment to the world. And part of that has to do with the fact, well, look at us. We all came from somewhere else. Everybody in our heritage came from some other place, even the Native Americans, the indigenous populations. They made it here because it was a place that no one else was at first. And it turned out to be a place with enormous challenges, but also enormous rewards. I now teach at the University of Maryland. The first thing I do in my leadership class is have the class separately, if it's like 25 kids in this seminar, I divide the Declaration of Independence into 25 parts and have them read aloud seriatim. The first paragraph, and we go right through it. This thing was written by 56 white people, white men, <clears throat> many of them slave owners. The purpose of my leadership campaign in my leadership course is to encourage them to have the values that will, that will nourish the civil society that we've created. So the next thing I do after they finish reading it aloud, and we also read the names, the places of birth, the, the, uh, how old they were at the time of the signing of all the 56 signers. And many of them, four or five, eight of them, I think eight or nine were, were born abroad, mostly in the UK, some, one in Wales, several in, in, in Ireland. Uh, as it was then configured, and so forth. And then I say, okay, let's look at us. Well, as you know from here, <clears throat> the undergraduate body in big public universities and big private universities is incredibly varied. It's, there are many young women in it, and the word woman, the word she, the word her, the word spouse, wife, it doesn't appear in the Declaration of Independence. They were in a very different place. <clears throat> and as we also know, part of the declaration was to allow them to do something, continue something, which they wanted to do and which was very lucrative for them, which was the buying and selling of slaves. Because many of them came from the South, as, 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 as you know from our, our, our prior presentations. This is a reality we live with. And the question then is, how do we proceed when we have and we've just seen it recently, in some, in, in, and it comes up in nodule, in nodule points that suddenly break through our not comprehending, that suddenly break through the distractions we have, and we're a big, complicated, self-governing invention. And we have a lot of things in our lives that means we don't have to pay attention to everything that happens, to every sparrow that falls that's reported in the media. It's not a concern of mine. But when one breaks through, like Charlottesville, 
and gives us, all of us, an opportunity to look again and catches our attention, despite anything that anybody might have said about it, just the fact that it occurred the way it occurred, that there was a death and that there was violence. We're charged with the question that I think is before our president. Is there a moral equivalence in any of these issues between, it isn't between right or left in this case, it's, in, it's the difference between anti-Semitism and acceptance, between suppression of people of color and acceptance and support of them. If the first, if the, if the declaration said <clears throat> we have inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, what does that exactly mean? Is it liberty, as Martin Luther King wrote from a Birmingham jail? It's, it's liberty only for one. It's education only for one. The opportunity of liberty is meant to be equal. They said these are inalienable rights. They didn't identify women as part of it, and it took women until the 1920s in this country to get full voting rights. But they got them. There are people in this country who've been here longer than any of our families have been here. They have the same rights, maybe. It's not guaranteed. The founding fathers knew, as well as we all know today, that all the actual reality of such things as freedom of speech, i.e. the First Amendment, are always, through history, are always under, under the, the threat of repression by leaderships. It's true through all of history, and you know that. We can go all the way back to, to really to classical times and look at, look at what happened in Greece and how they struggled to find and to create a society where men could come together and speak freely and exchange ideas without being controlled by their governments. And we've had these issues over and over and over again. They're before us today. But I want to sound a a hopeful note here, uh, because we're going to go forward and look at some of this stuff, but some of it is not different from the way I've started. So I want to think about, I want to ask you to think with me about uh, Winston Churchill. You know, his mother was an American. And he, he had a great, you know, experience with the United States of America and with Americans through his entire life, uh, including all through the war. And you know, he, he had troubles with, with Roosevelt to start with when Roosevelt was a young man and they met uh, in, in, the, in the sequence of World War I and Roosevelt didn't like him and Churchill had a low opinion of Roosevelt and so forth. They became fast friends and a trying relationship with many different, many different issues around it and not always successful for Churchill. And Churchill said after the fact when he was asked, what are the Americans like? Because you know them so well. He said, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> so the point is, is that history can be unforgiving, but we in our lives have the responsibility to think about exactly what Churchill said, that you can trust them to do the right thing after they try everything else. We're free to try everything else. We're trying something now, which we is, is unexpected. The, we heard about the dynamics of how that came about. It came about with a very small group of people who were determined to vote for a certain person, and while a lot of other people, for reasons that are not so clear, maybe not so clear then, maybe a little bit clearer now, didn't want to vote for the, any of the two, the other candidate. And that process eliminated all the contenders in the, in the, run, up, in the run up to, that, to our, our recent election. And now here we are. So what does it mean for, for, for us who are users of the media, of the news media? Uh, do we read the local paper? Do we, does, does the local paper hear from you? I know people in this room who, who, are, who are devoted uh, writers of letters to the editor. <laughs> Oh, I, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what's the purpose of that? It's not only to talk to the editor, it's to put an idea or a, or a point of view before the public who might read the letters to the editor column. That's just an act of engagement. And it applies to all of us. 
and and as was said earlier, you put it out there for the people. You can't guarantee who they're going to who they're going to vote for. In my entire career in journalism, which began at the age of 19 when I was in my sophomore year at Harvard, through a complete set of circumstances which were entirely accidental, I met a Holocaust survivor, a woman who was in her 30s, <clears throat> who had started her life in the woods, the ghetto, the largest uh, uh, Jewish ghetto in Central Europe at the time. The city in, in, in uh, Roman letters is L-O-D-Z. It's a major city in the center of Poland. Um, this woman, she, she remembered she was probably 13, or maybe 14. She doesn't really remember. She had no documents at all when I met her. Um, I'll just give you a quick scan of her history. So she was in a family of, of three generational family in this in this ghetto, and out of nowhere, catastrophe struck. And in the third week of the of the of the of the German invasion of, of Poland, her family was was sur surrounded and they took control of the ghetto. And over the next six years, she survived many of the killing concentration camps and the holding camps that led, that led to the elimination of six million people, as we, uh, three million people as we know. Millions others than she, she survived it all. Her family was erased. After one agonizing event, after another, after another, after another, she lived through it all. The father of one of my roommates worked for the Joint Jewish Distribution Committee, which had been in existence since the, since the uh, 19th century, which, re, which tried to get Jews out of the pogroms that were happening in Central Europe and move them, if they could, to what was then typically called the Holy Land or to Palestine. And um, this organization, after the war, you know, there were millions of people who were stateless. They had no records. They had no, they had no nothing left to them. Whether it wasn't just about concentration camps, it was about people whose cities and, and, and uh, and, and towns had been fought over by two or three sides in the course of the, of the long war. And they had nothing left. And they were in displaced persons camps all over Central Europe, in Austria, uh, in Germany, and elsewhere. And the joint committee, as it was shorthanded, the joint brought people in around the US immigration laws in the late 1940s. And she got into the country that way and brought with her her, her husband and a baby that they had had. And she grew up in, basically, she spent her, the rest of her life in, in the Bronx, in New York City. She wanted to tell her story to somebody. And the father of my, my, my roommate's father said, well, maybe you should talk to my, I should have you talk to my son, who's interested in writing and maybe majoring in, in, in writing at, at, at Harvard University. He mentioned it to me. I said I would go talk to her. I spent two and a half years in re-interviewing her and her, her story, which, I wrote f with her and for her because she had very poor English and she was writing her story and her memories in Polish and then translating it word for word out of a Polish, into, using a Polish Eng English dictionary and getting a, a narrative that way. We went over the whole sequence again and the, the book was published the year I graduated from college in 1962. I went into the Navy on active duty. I took several copies with me. I put it in the wardroom library. And I said to the captain of our ship, a, a guided missile destroyer, when he asked me, what, you know, what do you want to do when you're, why are you here? I said, well, I brought something, which is why we're here. And I want you to have it in the, <clears throat> in, in the uh, library for the officers and for the crew. I did active duty, it was pre-Vietnam. When, when I got out of the Navy, uh, I went immediately to a local newspaper up in upstate New York and began working there. So I've been doing this thing since I was 19 and now I'm 77. So it's been a long, strong, a long string. Never stopped reporting, never stopped having editors, for good or for ill. <laughs> I never stopped having colleagues, almost always for the good, very few for the ill. And a lot of places, a lot of stories. I've lived out of the country, all this stuff. We're now at a crossing point for ourselves, I believe, and I've said this to the kids in my two classes, and it's not being, uh, I'm not taking advantage of anybody's age or lack of age. We're all in this thing together. 
we have a commitment to use the media in a way that will be useful to the media, but useful to the civilization. And if we just take it in and don't do anything about it, except once in a while every four years maybe go and vote, or once in a while every few years vote in a local election, maybe, or vote in the congressional elections, maybe once or twice, depending on whether I like the person or not. If we don't engage with it, we're leaving it to others to do as they will with it. And that's not getting what I'm supposed to be doing, which is informing people. It's not getting it anywhere, but it's also not being helpful to you. So I'm here to ask for activism and to think about how journalism and the First Amendment fit together in all our lives, because they do. These two things are, they run, they didn't write it for nothing. And it wasn't the First Amendment by accident. It could have been the third, the seventh, or something else. They'd been through their own issues. Their declaration had a whole, as you recall, it has a whole a, a bill of attainders against, against the king, about all the interdictions of the king that interfered with their having a, what they perceived to be a new kind of society that was responsive to the, great, to the Enlightenment that came in the 15th and 16th centuries and 17th centuries and led forward to the 18th century evocations of divided, uh, divided rule, of, of a, government, a government that derived its power only from the people and from no other place, from no divine right, from no hereditary right. And it depended upon the people to give it the shape, the consistency, the coherence, and the lawfulness that they opined for. They wrote the declaration in the middle of a war, remember? That was written in 1776. The war had broken out a year before in 1775, and it went on for a number more years, and then came the creation of the, of, the, of the Constitution, a mysteriously interesting, complicated document. The First Amendment of that document says Congress shall make no law with regard to, I can read it to you if you'd like, but want to hear it? Yeah. Happy. It's, it's in my own scrawled hand. It's a few more than 40 words. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, semicolon. This is there, this is there. Everything we're reading here is what they wrote. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. Period, full stop. You won't hear the word or the, or the acronym FOIA in here. No, no such thing as a Freedom of Information Act. No such thing as they don't address libel laws. They don't address non-libel laws. They don't address anything except telling you what the Congress can't do. They understood, which both of our prior speakers have, have underscored, they understood that we were going to be a self-inventing democracy whether it's a republic, a democracy that it's a republic, or a full, open, uh, you know, highest number of voters wins period with nothing in between, whether it was gonna be a pure democracy, they weren't so sure, and they didn't know what was gonna come next. But they did know they had to make an interdiction and to say forcefully and thoughtfully and fully to us, Congress shall make no law, why? to protect our rights, not theirs, ours. That was the purpose of it. If we don't redeem that right, we're missing the point. And it's not about age, it's not about race, it's about the civility that was engendered and foreseen in the notion that we all had certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and, I yeah, and in the, first, in the first iteration, when they first looked at the, at, at the first, and there were many drafts to the, to the Declaration, when they first looked at it, it said, life, liberty, and pursuit of property. And you know, these were people who were very interested in property. They owned property that was on two legs, lots of it. And they made lots of money doing that in the future. But property didn't get it there for them. And they went back, and that's when Jefferson came up with life, liberty, and the, in, 
it's effervescent, always in front of us, pursuit of happiness. In the context of those times, as we know, one of the common understandings of the meaning of that word happiness was notions of devotion to the community, service to the community, because that's how you derived your, your sense of self-esteem self, self and self-regard and self -regard and a place in the world. None of that is changed. I'll put it another way. We're not off the hook yet. We're all there. And the purpose of our conversations and this discussion today is to explore how do we respond when we have issues that have to do with things we can't control and we can't really, it's not within our control and it's not meant to be within our control. But when there's a public diction that does make a moral equivalence between pro-Nazis and people who are not, not Nazis, people who stand for opening the society and for getting rid of or reshaping the relics that pay tribute to a, to a repressive goal, which was the expansion of the slave state, of the slave nation, which was what that was mostly all about, entirely all about in terms of its ethics, its standards, and its morality. And to place people on pedestals, we can agree or disagree. There's been some, there's been some disagreement, and now we're coming back around to it. A few weeks ago in the Washington Post, the newspaper where I spent 25 years, they had a front page story about a woman who's just been admitted to Georgetown in the freshman class. She's a legatee, she's a legatee of her family's enslavement, of it being sold by the university in the 1830s. The Post has been very good about capturing that story and with great cooperation from the leadership at Georgetown University to put it in front of us and allow us I'm not a Georgetown graduate. I have a great regard for Georgetown as a great university. But they put in front of its, its readership and for the world because guess what? Every word that appears in the Washington Post or any other newspaper can be seen instantaneously as soon as it's published around the world. I was reading the paper, your paper this morning just to see what's in it, to see what is being covered, because it's in my blood to do so. So what's happened there? In Georgetown, they came to life around this issue, around the issue of what their own past had been. It's happened at Yale, it's happening at Harvard, and people are addressing the past in new ways because we're coming to a different place. And I've said to the kids, let's look at us in our class. Do we resemble the people who wrote the declaration, no way. We are too diverse, we are too complicated, we are too possessed of our differences and our efforts to bring our differences to new understandings with our interlocutors. And I just, I, talking to Akil today, just at lunch, he made a, I, you didn't say this, did you, when you talked, that you know, in many parts of the, of the society, People who are of, people meet each other for the first time across racial and social, economic and, and ethnic backgrounds and, and gender orientation for the first time in their lives actually at college. Because they can't do it anymore in this country on, on the basis of black or white. That's not there anymore. And as we know, the whole issue of gender orientation has become a huge political issue in many, many states animating the most bitter entrenched ideas by the leaders in these societies and the kids are watching. The kids are witness to us. So we have these obligations. The purpose of, of our, our profession, some people call it a profession, some people call it a craft. It's probably a bit of both. It's probably more craft than possession, I, a profession, I don't know. What I do know is that it's idea its goal and what I teach and what you live with, these things, this thing, just think of it as a front page. It's meant to be a mirror of who we are. We teach the standards and the expectations and the disciplines and the history of how do you get this to be the most accurate mirror possible. 
that tells to the public fact-based, verifiable, coherent journalism that wherever possible gives the context of an event, gives the context of a, of a clash, gives the context of fact. The University of Maryland, where, I, where I'm, I'm on the faculty, is basically a big STEM university. It's, it's, it has, it's got really high, high ratings for what it does in its specialty. I teach journalism and literature and journalism. Many of the kids who come to those classes are in these STEM courses. And they come there because it's an elective. They got some extra time. They need to learn uh, you know, to, to get another credit. They come to the course for the purpose of expanding and reaching out past where they've been in there, in there and to help them get forward. What is this about? If we leave until people get to be 18, 19, 20, 21, the opportunity to meet others who are different from us in the context of something that's meant to be a place of learning, like a public school, we're not doing our work. We're not committing in the way we need to be committed. But you're asking the press to report about these things, report about the controversies, the clashes, and so forth. What's the upshot? Well, we have to live a lot of the time with things that are not good. Part of the power of democracy, of, of, of the people, by the people, and for the people, is that if we put the truth in front of them, the facts in front of them, they will look to do the right thing. So journalism requires interactions with all of us, not just as we're sitting here today, but throughout our lives. And the journalism that's performed this way can help us. It's not an enemy. It's not an enemy of the state. It's not an enemy of the president. It's not, it doesn't have a position on those matters. It is looking for truth. It is looking for fact-based, verifiable, contextual information to put in front of you. There are some, and there are editorial pages, there are op-ed pages, and there are editorials on the air, on television. There are editorials all over the internet by everybody. Anyone's free to express their opinion. We're not talking about that. We're talking about using the powers of the, that are given to us to report accurately to others. From the, let me just go, let me put, do this. This thing is a, this stands in a new way at the heart of the, of, the, of the human experience. If we go back, all the way back, way before the invention even of, of symbols that became written languages, people were scrawling things on caves in France, in, they, they were carving things on rocks in Australia. We can find traces of this kind of expression. What were they doing? One thing they were doing is they were witnessing. And by putting something on a cave wall, they were bearing witness. We are social animals. We are going to be witnessing. We have those witnessing powers. We have powers that, that allow us to hear, to touch, to, to feel, to see. Not all of us have all those powers, but most of us do. Many of us do, and for those who don't, we're learning how to reach those audiences, those peoples, in new ways. And that's part of the amazing power of these things. So we have the power to witness and to bear witness, to send it to somebody else. And we have that power. We expect that from, the, from people who are, call themselves news people. We expect they're going to do that with as accurate a mirror as they can get, so they can get it out to us in as accurate a way. We can, dis, we can disagree greatly about all that's there, but we have to start with some kind of premise. And the premise is the media in this country, and we know this standing here, I'm standing here, and we're here together. We know the media is not an enemy. It can, be, it can make us very disputatious, it can make us disappointed, it can make us want to throw something, maybe at the screen, or maybe at a human being, or maybe at a newspaper, or a news organization. We know all these things. But the purpose of the, of, the, of, the, of the ability of us is to extend our own reach, to get us to places we can't get to, but that we have an obligation to know about. Whether it's around the block, around the corner, or around the world. That was the premise 
of the First Amendment, that we would have the most free access to that. What did it come out of? It came out of their commercial interests. It also came out of the fact that they lived in a world of great danger. It came through a sequence. When these people arrived on this continent, there were people already here. The indigenous people were already here. In the first encounters, it was peaceful, and then it didn't take very long. In Virginia, the first landings were in the early 1600s, and within, by the end of the first decade, there had been armed combat already. Not particularly organized, but there had been combat with weapons. The same thing happened in New England. And these sequences tell us that our, our nation was built in part in violent clashes. We need to understand that, and we need to understand one of the things that came out of that. They needed accurate, verifiable, contextual information about what was it over the next hill, what was it the next river crossing, what was here on these on this tidal flats where others were inhabiting or fishing. What do we need to know about that? So we don't, no surprises. So journalism became inherent and the need for accuracy of journalism was part and parcel of what grew in this country. We can go through the Zenger trial in 1735. The Zenger trial set a standard, one of these nodule points that sticks up through the course of history. The John Peter Zenger trial was about a, a publisher who was being jailed by the, by the king's representative because he, he, the, the news organization, the news, the news sheet that he worked for, printed accurate facts about about repressions and, and distortions of the law by the king's representatives. The king's representative sued for libel. It was a libel case. It went before a jury, and the jury said, <clears throat> the defense here is, the, is truth. We have looked into this. These stories which you say are defame are in fact accurate, and truth is a, is a defense against libel. And it became the first sort of point that r remains in the early colonial period that tells us where they were headed. Years later, we get, to the, we get to the Declaration, and the Declaration itself was an exercise in a kind of journalism. It was a polemic, but if you read it through, you will see by the king, the whereas he did this, and the whereas he does that, and the whereas he does the other thing, you're gonna see what they're setting up are reasons to create a society where search and, search and seizure was going to be restrained or prevented. There were going to be rules against that. They were setting up a society that had a space for people to create a civil, responsive, multi-generational democracy where pursuit of happiness would not be interdicted by anybody's powers. And you would decide for yourselves, we together, what the nature of those, those differences and that, those opportunities would be. We would decide for ourselves what would be libelous or not, and it would maybe change from state to state, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but under the creation of the United States of America, this new nation, there was one interdiction, Congress shall make no law. We have to play that back to ourselves. We have to understand that empowers us in new ways. And the idea that you would create a polemic that says these people are, they are a threat to our democracy, these journalists are enemies of the people. These journalists are enemies of change. They're enemies of getting forward. We have to play that in our heads and come to our senses and say to ourselves, yeah, some are, but some aren't. Some people, some people are racists and some aren't. And where's the moral equivalence that has to do with accuracy, fairness, objectivity, and the tenets of most journalism in this country. So we're at a crossing point in, in our sense of, of our awareness of it, our sensitivity to it, and our ability to respond to it. That's my theory. I think it's the right theory. I think it, what has to happen in this country, we have to have a rebirth of commitment to supporting and to advocating for the things we know have been important to us in our lives before this, before a president of the United States denounced journalists broadly, showed favoritism to one or two because, or three or four, because of other, for other reasons, or because they agreed with his positions. 
If we get divided like this, we're only hurting ourselves. We're preventing our society from functioning as fully as it can with as full of an, an expression of our goals to do what was set out for us, which was to do pursuit of happiness, life, and liberty. And liberty means liberty to have equal opportunity amongst us. So journalism is part of the long, complicated, and always self-inventing uh, root of this, of this nation of ours through the world. People turn to us for particular reasons. They want to come here because there's opportunity here, and there always has been. That's part of who we are. It's part of the pursuit idea that if you can get here, you can have an opportunity to pursue these things. So for all of us whose people came from somewhere else, for every one of us has some kind of a story in our heads about how they got here, where they came from. Many of us in my generation now at this age, retired or semi-retired, we often go back to find where they came from and to look and to use, you know, to go into ancestry and find out what were their exact names and what were their births and deaths. Why does it matter to us? Because it gives substance to our memories and substance to the notion of who we are as, as individuals and who we are as people whose forebears aspired to give us a better life. Part of what that is about, when you go on Ancestry.com, you're doing journalism. Hello. <clears throat> and in every, in every laboratory in this university, in every lab and, and bench lab at the University of Maryland, what are they doing there in, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? They're looking for truths. Journalism is in the same sequence. It's looking always for explainable, understandable information about what just happened or what is going to happen. Just today or yesterday, one of these astonishing searches for truth uh, passed a benchmark. What was that? It was the, <clears throat> the spacecraft that, yeah, exactly, passed through Saturn's rings and on out. And it's, it's, it's following two other American-built deep space probes, which are moving out beyond, way out beyond the solar system, and out past, they're going to move ultimately past the, the reach of the sun, and move entirely into, into outer space. And they're still in contact with us. If we never had anything that demonstrated to us our curiosity, in our intense desire to find as much as we could about the life beyond our reach, those spacecraft are part of it. They didn't go out there because the values of this country were repressive, were divisive, were based on denouncement and fury. They were based on years and years and years of people working together and using the powers of their journalism which was accuracy of data, accuracy of, of, of celestial motion, accuracy of the materials they were using to build their spacecraft that could withstand outer space. They were using that accuracy to build something special and something new and to bring back to us together new informations about a world we will never, we will never see except to see it through a telescope. Why did they do that? What's that about? What are those values about? Th those are the same values that we have every day in our lives and the same values that, is, that, are, that are part of what we're nourished by having a First Amendment, which said there won't be any interdictions from the national government this way in these areas. They probably should have put in a further restriction, but it didn't happen. I'll get to that in a moment. What it meant, though, when they said Congress shall make no law, is there's no representative of the government sitting in the newsroom of the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or <clears throat> the New York Post or any of the papers that are run by people whose, whose 
owners may have great differences about where they think this country ought to go. There's no government official riding herd on us. What does that tell us? It tells us we live in a society where, where the government is going to be held at some length from us in the same way they're held at, in some length from getting into the, the, the issues, the knowledges that are being learned by that spacecraft. They're supporting it. They're not denouncing it. They're helping it get further and helping distribute the information. This thing represents us in ways that we cannot imagine right now. The World Wide Web gives us the opportunity to know each other, to hear each other, and to see how we act in our own societies in new ways. The world watches this nation. The world watches this nation because it's been a great light in a lot of darkness for many, many, many decades. We need to have a responsible, careful, thoughtful discussion about issues of moral equivalence and how do you want the press, the media to deal with that. We've gone beyond and the big issue we have is how do you do he said, he said when one of what this person said is essentially unacceptable. And simply to even express it, you can say that's that, but you can't say it's morally equivalent. We're not going to get into that space, but we're going to give it to you in a way that can be understood and you can make your own decisions. Our issues going forward are no less vital now than they were at any other time in our lives. And most of us here lived through, lived through the turmoil around the Vietnam War. We've lived through a lot of these kinds of issues in which the society responds as best it can. And when it does, when, when the wheel of history moves, it often moves in ways that are very, very ugly and destructive where people get hurt, where bad things, negative things happen, and we get to another place. The only way we're going to keep track of all this and have people help us do that is to let them do, give them the opportunity and the freedom to do it in the, in the notion that they are supporting our goals. If these are our goals, the press is there to help you get there without being editorial about it, but just think of it as another sequence of experimentations to try to discover what's happening in our society in the same way that the spacecraft that just went past Saturn, believe it or not, is telling us things we couldn't possibly know any other way. We have to have the same thoroughness and desire for straight on information that those scientists have had in learning more about our Earth, about ourselves, about our society, and about the universe. Thank you very much. No, it's you. I think the hand, the, 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 I think that the, clap, the clapping actually ought to be for yourselves for, for being here and, and for taking this time from your lives that you could be doing other things. Thank you so much. Yes. Justice Brand, I said sunlight is the best of disinfectants, and I think uh, today, especially you know, my generation perhaps is in renewed uh, appreciation for journalism and the, the value you have in society, so thank you. Um, but I would like to ask you, uh, kind of looking back at the most recent election, um, Nate Silver has uh, what he calls the fallacy of objectivity. Yes. And so when you look back <clears throat> at the coverage that was given to Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, over 50% of the coverage of Hillary Clinton was negative. It was the emails, it was scandals, whereas with Donald Trump it was rather substantive. It was with building the wall, his plans for tax reform, even though he didn't really have any, but there was an assumption that Hillary would win, and so to appear as being objective, uh, a lot of coverage was given to positive as opposed to negative information about Donald Trump. For example, his history of discriminating against minorities in the 80s with apartments and bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just wondering, and the same thing we see with climate change, uh, the New York Times recently ran a front page cover story from a scientist who denied climate change, and they got a lot of backlash for that. <clears throat> um, well, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the difficulties today of trying to be objective, um, but not going too far. It's a great question. Next question. <laughs> I, 
I will tell you that, <clears throat> that I think that, that uh, in, in this line of work for us, the challenges are substantial. They're not insubstantial. And they've been raised to a completely different level because you, you have the, 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 the occupant of the bully pulpit in this country m making all kinds of claims and encouraging others to do the same thing. And, <clears throat> and for us, we have, to, we have to hew the line, get our facts down, get it in hand, and, and, get, it, and get it before you. And there is a question of moral equivalence, which is very disturbing. You know, it's not just a he said, he said. We're not just going to, we're not going to, you know, are we required to give equal space to, you know, neo-Nazis? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is we'll, we'll make those decisions as best we can. And if we fall short in it, we'll hear from you. I think that's the way to do it. I don't know any other way to do it. And to look for an engaged public and one that isn't just a spectator public. I think one of the issues we face, all of us face it, is that, and this is just speaking sort of in a slightly existential way. So I grew up uh, writing stories for newspapers, which had to be bought and had to be read this way. Then television came along. Before that came radio. Radio is interesting, interesting critter, <clears throat> because you know it's 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 one medium only. It's it's sound. If you have powers of powers of hearing, you can be doing almost anything in your life, and the radio can be part of you. And what I said when I, when I came to NPR, I actually grew up in a, in a family, my parents were radio, they wrote uh, radio shows for, for their living. So I'd been around the nature of radio. Radio's amazing because it's the only mass medium of the imagination. Because you can't see it and because it can be with you whether you're riding your bike or driving in your car or washing the dishes or reading a book, it's there with you. And it can give you, it can take you away from what you're doing in an astonishing way while you're doing that very thing that your life might depend upon. So it becomes an enormously important individual presence in your life and one of complete imagination since you can't see it. So I can give you an example. I was driving down the New York Thruway some years ago. Scott Simon of Saturday Morning Edition on NPR was interviewing a young woman whose family had been, been destroyed in, a, in, in the in the Cambodian Holocaust, this was years, some years ago. She'd written a book about it. He's interviewing her about the book. I'm driving down the thruway at 60 miles an hour. It's a Saturday morning. It's about nine o'clock in the morning on a March day and there are huge trailer trucks going by me, spewing <clears throat> you know, ice and snow around as we go down. That's important because if I make a mistake, I'm done. So, he's, so I'm, I'm, and the radio's on and Simon says, the voice comes out and says, uh, and then, and then what happened? Fourteen seconds of silence. And I found myself falling into the silence. I couldn't imagine what had happened. And then the voice came back and, and the young woman responded. But it left me almost paralyzed, thinking about the fact that she could not speak. So, and I, it, it helped me understand in a much clearer way than I had even before, and I'd been there for several years, the power of, the, of this medium to just command, you, command your psyche in a way you had never imagined. Because I thought, you know, as it went on, I, you know, the first thing you think of if you, in, my, in my business then is, oh, they've lost the signal. Yeah. <laughs> or I've lost it or something's going to intervene. Some of the splash hit the you know, antenna, I don't know. But it went on. So when I got back to NPR the ne uh, in, the, in the next week, I went to talk to the producer. Um, and I said to him, did you do anything in that? Do you, you remember what I'm talking about, the interview with the, with the Cambodian uh, survivor. And I said there was this a moment that went on for like 14 or 15 seconds because I started realizing it had been, and I started counting on the, on the steering wheel. He said, no, we didn't do anything to it. That's actually what happened. Why did they, so I said, why did you, why? He said, well, it told the truth of the gap between her ability to, to take the question and to summon up the answer for herself. So I began to, to see in a new way 
how the radio had become so important to people in a, in a particular way. That's around it. These things bring all of this to us. And they're bringing it to how many billion people around, the, around the God's earth? How many people, if we aggregated all the hits that are made on all the American media globally in any 24-hour period, what would we see? It would be phenomenal. It would be in the billions. So our power is to, be, to get to learn together, to respond in new ways, are not limited to just today or tomorrow. They provide for us a means by which we can see other people responding and learn other things in new ways. So we're part of the whole exploration and we're not separated from you all. That's my long answer to your very, very short question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm really glad you brought up the, uh, the, the use of the internet and everyone's uh, cell phone. That's now that the whole world thinks it's a right to have one. Uh, and I'm concerned about the fact that, you know, uh, journalism used to be considered a public good. They talk about taking funding away from PBS, but on the other hand, Citizens United gives unlimited you know, input from commercialization. Yes. So I think when you, with that as a backdrop, I'm concerned now that uh, the information you're getting off that is controlled by algorithms that we don't understand, and that you're not getting objective information when you search that anymore. It's going through a monetization process where it's being sold and then redistributed in a narrow cast way, reinforcing views. And I, think to, to, and I think that's a very serious issue. And mm -hmm. so in the last election, there's a concern you know, that we had foreign adversaries using our own information to, 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 to input that. How do you see that being addressed going forward as a public utility? How, how do you see that? I think that's a big issue. I, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I agree with you. It is, it's a huge issue. And, and I, didn't, I, didn't even, I didn't even talk about the, you know, the Russian presence in our, in, our, in our global media. I mean, they're there in a, in a particular way. And it comes out of, a, uh, out of a, a, a leadership which feels itself cornered and is doing everything it can to take apart the larger cooperative organizations and work on the differences and drive them apart. In the, it's very simple, EU, NATO, and the rest of it. Um, so I think these are co consequences, yes. How do we deal with it? You know, I, I can't speak for the industry. Partly I'm retired, but I can tell you you're exactly right, and, and there, has to be, there have to be new efforts, and there's a lot of exploration going on. We're having a, a, a conference at, uh, at, at Maryland uh, next month that goes on for three days, it's, and it's about these kinds of structural issues that have to do with the invasion that we're, and the manipulation that we're not part of, but is happening whether we want to be or not. And so, so when you wind up with aggregated news, for example, an aggregated news site, and there's an NPR report in there, how do we, you know, how, do, how does NPR know whether it wants to be there or not and whether, and, and what the purpose of that aggregation is, et cetera. Yeah, I, I guess. And understanding that emergent logic of distribution, right? Yes. So. Yeah. It's, it's a hard place. And there, there are no simple answers. And, you know, we're an experiment now. We're in a, in a complete experimental era. It's going to go on for years as people learn more and more about how to use, manipulate, and, and misuse the, the vast digital universe that we're living in now. Yes? Uh, do you think uh, Marshall McLuhan uh, foresaw when he said the medium is the message, uh, something like the way the, the media is, has overtaken our lives? You know, he, he was a visionary. And he was the first person, the first established a whole series of, of ideas to invigorate our thinking about mass media. So I'm not going to dispute the notion that we are going to be, that he, his, his vision that we would be overwhelmed by this and disintegrated by it, in effect. We're seeing the first, sort of par partially we're seeing that. It can be played with, but we're not inert in this. And if, for example, you go to an aggregate, a site of news aggregation, and you and you see things there that, that you think are either that don't belong there because they didn't, they shouldn't be, whatever your reasons are, you need to go to that individual and and just 
if you, if you feel that that's, you're being abused, you go to the originator of that site and make it so, and tell it, and, and put, your, put your message to them in a clear way, if you can. And you can also look for, look for further sites that are, that are exploring these spaces. There's a whole bunch of nonprofits that are exploring this very space right now. And they're learning about how, this, how to deal with this in new ways. They may always be outrun by the, you know, uh, by, by people who are misusing it for their own purposes. And we know that we've been, we have been manipulated, and we've been manipulated against our own, our own wishes by have, looking at sites that are faked, that are not what they say they are, that are, that are made up entirely, entirely fictitious. We live in Washington, uh, a few blocks from the, from the, um, the, pizza, the pizza place, where the guy walked in with a shotgun to, loaded to look, look for the, you know, the, 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 in, the, in the basement of this building where, the, where young, young girls were being escorted into, 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 se into se sexual captivity. That's what, and he walked in there ready to do, ready to, to fix it, ready to shoot somebody. If, or maybe, why, why would you have a loaded shotgun with you walking into a pizza parlor? Um, so, and that's still going on, the denunciations of the people who own the pizza parlor, and there's all kinds of stuff still energized around that, that issue, in that, that, that insane example. You know, we, can't, we cannot control that, but we can certainly make known our, you know, our disinterest in it by not going, next time you see it coming up, just don't go there. You won't be part of the, the digital, you know, you know the, the, the digital aggregation. I, I don't have a better answer than that, but I'm sure that that uh, that our our professors who know this, who know the structural issues, and deal with them at a le on a legal basis and know the legalities of it, can get us there. I would certainly go into that space if I were directly employed there, and I think it's going to be part of the discussions we're having at Maryland next month. Yes, sir. For most of our lives, we've dealt with the the problem of uh, freedom of information. Now we're challenged by the problem of freedom of misinformation. Yes. So how do we deal with that? You know, is there, what are your thoughts about ways to deal with that? There has always been misinformation of various kinds. We have, hmm. It's a very, it's a, for me, it's almost a, a question I can't, I don't think I'm qualified to answer. I, I've actually spent a good part of my life not dealing in misinformation. <laughs> and I've sort of lived in the other realm. And, and um, first of all, you use your, your common sense. That's one thing. And use your civil society background and grounding to ask yourself, well, if I just read something that actually makes any sense at all, is this something I should be as skeptical about as I am about what I, what I read on the editorial page of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post? Should I just take it with a grain of salt and not go rush off thinking this is the truth? Because there are many kinds of truths and there are people, yes, they're manipulating things that have to do, have to do with what looks like the truth and is not. It's, and it's a hard place to guide. It's like being at sea with, you know, almost without a compass, but you've got a compass but you can't see exactly all that's around you, but you can, you can navigate according to your best, into your best instincts and your best knowledges and your experiences. It's not a, it's not a. It, no, no regulatory approach, that, is that paradoxical? I'd, 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 ask, I'd ask the, uh, the, the legal scholars whether there's a regulatory regime that can be entered into. I don't know how you'd qualify it in or out. Uh, that, that the problem with, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, but what would we have? We would have a, 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 a it would sound like almost something out of the Napoleonic law. You would have to sort of establish that there was a wrong truth and then follow it all the way through and prove it all the way back down to prove that, a, 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 you know, that a, an illegality was, was committed. This nation of ours has been very open on, on, on free speech. We have the ACLU, some of whose, uh, representatives and, and members of the ACLU are here. ACLU defended the right of, of Nazis to march in Skokie, Illinois years ago. 
you know, they got a lot of hot water for it, but they, they defended the right of them to exercise their powers of free speech. That's correct. What we have to follow is, you know, the, 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 the basic edict. You know, you don't yell fire in a, in, a, in a crowded theater. You just don't. That's one of the rules of a civil society. You can't be, you know, you, you, you can't be arrested maybe for having done that unless you set the fire yourself. But you can get into trouble by making baseless threats against people and, 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 and sounding alarms when they don't exist, false alarms. If you, if you don't pull the firebox just out of fun. So, you know, there are, there are general rules that the society puts into place that it helps to cage the notions of acting uh, uh, irresponsibly. Sir, you mentioned, you used the term common sense, and it brought to mind Thomas Paine. Mm -hmm. And you started out your presentation by talking about the revolution. And I think most of us here realize from our history that the revolution wasn't preordained to be successful. Um, and Mr. Paine came along with his famous article and kind of turned the tide. Um, it, it, it makes me wonder if we're living in an age now where um, is it that perilous that it could go either way in, in the context of what we're going through now? You know, there's a now now deceased um, uh, essayist and, and philosopher about some of this, Richard Hofstetter's piece in, in Harper's from probably 19, 1960s that, that poses the question that democracy, that our, our kind of democracy rides very on a very thin, very thin membrane that can easily, you know, disintegrate or morph into something else. And the question here for us today is, it's, it's been real all the way through. We've gone through periods of, of, of intense, you know, distortions of the, of, the public, of, the, of the public diction. We went through it with, with McCarthy for four years, the Red Scare. We, we've done it at different times. We keep surviving in a way. But I, I, so I don't have an answer for you. I think it's, to some extent, it's Churchill's answer. They'll, they'll try anything, <laughs> you know, but you can trust them. And, and I think we, we have that capacity to do that. And maybe we're in that kind of a space right now where, you know, we're trying everything else, but you can rely upon them, you know, always to do the right thing. And, we, but, that, but that's part of what a self-governing sequence is. And we do have norms and, and expectations, and we do have a civil polity which, which is very, very tolerant of lots of things. In that vast sea of tolerance, there are all kinds of issues that arise all the time that have to do with proper use and misuse of it, and abuse of it. And we've lived with that through our lives, and we've always come out because we come back to the basics of what was the founding nature of this, of this democracy. Which, so I think that's there for us. And one of the reasons I started out where I did is because it is what is in us. It's like a DNA. You know, I lived in Central Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They're struggling all across Eastern Europe to get the democracy, to reconnect to the democracies they had in the immediate period after World War I and before World War II. Hungary, Ch Czech Republic, Slovakia, all the way down, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth. Uh, the Baltic states, they have the same issues. They had a brief, brief moment of democracy when they had free elections, fair elections, and an open society, multi-party multi -party parliamentary democracies. And then it was cut off completely. And now they, it came back to life after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and now there are struggles in some of these places. In Hungary, in the Czech Republic, there are, there are r powerful, different, despotic, r rise of despotically in interested politicians and political parties that are being heard, and they're having a, a reverb in the society. We're not gonna be away from that, in part because we may even have friends and relatives in those places, so we're going to hear from them to some extent what's happening. But in our own lives, we have these issues all the time. We weren't born yesterday. 
and we weren't guaranteed to live in complete political tranquility. We have to understand where do we become active in a way that, is, that, that defends the, the principles of this great democracy. And we're doing it any time we vote and vote with knowledge. We don't do it when we vote either in ignorance or don't vote at all. That's just a start. That's like a baseline litmus test for us. Yes, sir. I'd like to just make a couple of uh, observations about the, uh, the media. Um, and I listen to NPR all the time, as I'm sure most of you do. I like what you said about the 14 seconds uh, break. Uh, and I find that in the media, there's no break like that in, in, in national public radio, not even a second or two. There's one story right on top of the other. And why is that? So that uh, more things can be, I don't know, sold. And I think presentation counts in, in every kind of way. So I think that, the, you know, some of those uh, discredits the media gets, I think, could be looked at. Now, I certainly don't agree with uh, anything Donald Trump says, but I see that in, in uh, national public radio all the time. One story right on top of the other, you don't have time to think about the other, uh, the, what, what went ahead, what went after. So that's one thing. And the other thing I see is that I would love to see national public radio say more about uh, you know, the facts uh, that they've researched. Uh, a simple right. statement saying, uh, uh, this is from Pew Research, lots of respect. Uh, comes from those of us who, you know, have that kind of thing for a number of people who do these, you know, like you, uh, do these researches all the time. I don't think we do enough of that. And yet, NPR gets off on a, a tangent, and uh, now they're doing thank you, thank you, thank you for everything at the national level and at the, at the uh, local level, and it's, it's just overdone. So maybe we do need to look, maybe not in such a negative way, mm -hmm. but maybe we need to look at how uh, we present so, the news. Just... Technical about it. The, the, the stations, I'm not sure what station you may listen to. Um, these stations are all what are known as uh, uh, educational com non commercial stations, NCEs, non commercial educational stations. And they have certain requirements under the Federal Communications Act, the parts of that are still, uh, still alive and well, to limit the so called number of underwriting credits in any one hour. Uh, with regard to how they, how, how they produce their stories, uh, you know, I think what you ought to do, what I would do if I were you, if I was unhappy with the station, I would just call them up, say I want to talk to the general manager, station manager, or I want to talk to your news director. If you can't take, take my, then I want to send you an email, and I want to express my views about what's wrong with the way you're, you're, you're producing your news. Done it. Doesn't make a difference. <laughs> get as many do it again get as as you can in that amount of time so that you can sell more so that you can uh, uh, talk about the things well there's, there's one other thing that they may be they may be they may be observing or maybe observing it in the breach or not observing it at all there are there are there are regulations in how many of those underwriting credits you can put on the air in any one hour and how long they can be and you may notice that most of those credits are 10 seconds long, and they probably do three in a row. They might sometimes do four. They hardly ever do more than that. But I can't speak for the station you're listening to, I, but I would just say, don't be discouraged by not being paid attention to. They're busy, you're busy, but if you've got time to write them, send it back to them again, say, I haven't heard from you, or give them a call, and say, I want to talk to your, I want to talk to your ombudsperson your person who, you know, who, who pays attention to our public, our, our public views, I want, to, I want to lodge my views with you. Will you listen to me? I don't think that's unreasonable.